thank you all uh, for coming here tonight. Uh, my name is Klaus Rodenberg. Uh, I'm the uh, current chair of the uh, Alberta chapter of the uh, Green Building Council and we are the co-hosts here with the uh, Alberta Council of Technology. I think I can speak for everyone in the government that we commend the Alberta Council of Technologies and the Canadian Green uh, Building Council and all of your sponsors for organizing this timely symposium. I spent uh, some time this afternoon in the sessions here today and uh, I was very impressed with uh, all of the discussion, the questions were, were excellent, the answers were even better. I'm delighted to be able to bring greetings on behalf of the City of Edmonton. Uh, I, one of the things that struck me a while ago, and I, and I, that, that, and I think it's what drives me forward, and I think what drives my colleagues forward, is that we live in a northern climate here, which is, is an inherently questionably sustainable one. Uh, I think we do so because there's great advantages to us to live here, there's great prosperity in this part of the world, but I think it also creates some challenges for us in how we can continue to live here in this northern part of the world in a way uh, that doesn't sort of swallow up all the footprint of others. And, and I, I, think, I think that challenge is an interesting one because I, I think if we can solve some of the problems here, you can do it anywhere. And I think that creates a kind of opportunity for us to get out in front and to really lead. And I think you guys in this room represent the people that can do that for us. We have all also taken on, however, a, a, a new objective, which will be our environmental strategic, strategic plan called The Way We Green. Uh, it's a 10-year plan um, and will uh, use the knowledge of academics, industry scientists, nonprofit representatives, and the public to identify the sustainability issues facing Edmonton and offer meaningful ideas for meeting and adapting to those issues. So I hope a lot of you guys will be engaged in that as we put that plan together. We have also made very recently a commitment to creating a renewable energy task force um, that again is designed to bring together a wide variety of stakeholder groups to determine how the City of Edmonton can best support and encourage the use and adaptation of the renewable energies. And, and I was also encouraged to see that you guys were doing some work on, on uh, food security. We've, our new municipal development plan has committed the city to developing uh, a food security strategy. That's brand new, hot off the press. We still got so thank you on behalf of the city of Edmonton. And the technology's ready. Um, I think the province isn't ready, is the challenge that we've found. Um, once we can figure out how to put a royalty on the sunshine, we would have a fantastic solar industry in this province. Um, in our meetings with the government, they've told us that uh, they don't want to subsidize one industry over another. And besides, they've put $2 billion into carbon sequestration, which means a subsidy to the coal industry. If we are competing on a level playing field with some of the other utilities, uh, whether they be nuclear, coal power, where they're paying their full share of health care costs and pollution costs, then solar would be ready today. Unfortunately, all of those costs are borne by the public and not by the utility companies that are producing that energy. Here, you get, you got to understand that 
the risks here are significant. You got early stage companies and an early stage industry. Typically, you got market pull. In this case, you got a product service push, and the what pulls those two together is government regulation and legislation, and that's an unknown. The risk is difficult to quantify, to control, to mitigate in this in this space. You look at the big crash that's predicted in China with the solar investment over over invested and so they're saying that there's going to be a big crash in that space um is it is that potentially an issue you invest and you have false economies and then when the rubber meets the road and you have to deliver value is there really a market for what you're selling so so i'd, I'd suggest the trade-off then just to, just the levering what's been said by the panel is that you treat the government funding like a private equity player and yeah. only by doing that can you use that leverage effect that david spoke of earlier if you're getting seven to one on financing that's absolutely enormous and then when you add debt to, to the projects and so on you probably got to you, you know somewhere north of 20 to one at the end of the day so like the alberta enterprise uh, Three funds. You, they got three hundred million, I think, to, to throw onto these deals. They they play it right. They got three billion dollars to invest in the economy, and you're pulling those resources from outside the province into Alberta, and equally importantly, identifying the opportunity that's here, encouraging those cluster participants and so on into this community. What about the entrepreneurs that are trying to get into the energy business? When I say get in, I mean get a company profitable. And then, what about the policy level for the larger scale developments, the large scale players. And I personally believe that um, there, should be a, there should be a difference on how they're treated. I mean, just like we have a small business tax, if, you make, if your company ma makes less than $400,000 a year, you get taxed differently in this country. I personally believe that uh, there's such a barrier to entry to getting into the energy business that giving the people who are trying to break in an unfair advantage or a little boost up on how to get in and my personal opinion is not so much the picking winners of, oh, that company applied and they won, you know, but ideas like a tax incentive, uh, something that anybody can qualify for. Uh, it's not necessarily doling dollars out, but it's, a, it's an opportunity to give the little guy an unfair advantage to at least get in the game and then sink or swim, where so many of them would like to play, uh, have thought about playing, but the, door, you know, the hurdle's just so high to even get in the pool that uh, they're not even swimming in the space yet. Again, we're, an, we're a world energy hub in Alberta. Think of all that we could do if we had the right mechanisms in place and the right incentives in place to really get ourselves on center stage. And finally, I mean, I've been investing um, at, at Pan Canadian and it, then, then in Canna and then at EPCOR uh, in the 1990s. And that was well before clean tech ever came on the radar screen. And so now, and I mean, Cheryl Arkison, who's here in the audience, she's been doing it too, you know, and we've been doing it since the 1990s. And, and it is, it, we are now at such a great point where we either get it right in Alberta or we're going to fall behind. And so, so I think we've got, you know, again, we're right on the cusp. Incentives, we need more of them Alberta-based. Canada. So, you know, we know that money's out there to fund things and that's why we have, you know, um, Hollywood North and Vancouver and, and Toronto. Um, but when it comes down to industries like this, I believe uh, is that matching funds make much more sense. And it's because you can bring the expertise but force them to come closer to where the activities that you're trying to support are. Um, so saying that, um, but at the end of the day, where economies seem to get, you know, what's happening in China is 